question. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Saru Kaiser, and I am the Education and Mobilization Coordinator here at Breast Cancer Action. Joining us on the webinar today is Julia Liao, who's the manager of the California Healthy Nail Salon Collaborative, and Nika Leiba, who's the senior analyst with Environmental Working Group. Before we get started, I just want to remind everyone on the call today that Breast Cancer Action doesn't take money from any corporation that profits from or contributes to the breast cancer epidemic. Our work is largely supported by individual donors. Please consider making a $25 donation today to support work like these educational webinars. I want to go over just a few rules of webinar etiquette before we start with the presentation. The presentation of Toxic Cosmetics will last for about 45 minutes. We'll make sure to save time at the end for questions. Everyone except the speakers will be muted during the webinar to cut down on any background noise and to ensure that we can all hear well. We want you to get involved with Breast Cancer Action, and this webinar is a great way to do that. Please stay tuned for other ways we'll mention later on. So I'd like to go over our agenda before we start. First, I'm going to give a brief summary of the problem with cosmetic regulation. And I'll also talk about the connection between our current Think Before You Pink campaign and why we need safer cosmetics. Nico will describe the chemicals we're talking about when we say toxic cosmetics. And Julia will talk about the health impacts on workers, the work that the California Healthy Nail Salon can be a model for the nation. And last but not least, we'll talk about ways for you to take action to protect everyone's health. And again, like I said, we will save time at the end for questions. So Breast Cancer Action was founded in 1990 by a group of women who were frustrated with the lack of information about breast cancer. Our founders, only one of whom is still alive today, knew that their private medical crises were part of a larger public health emergency and that the experiences of those dealing with breast cancer needed to be heard to address the crises. Breast Cancer Action's mission is to carry the voices of people affected by breast cancer to inspire and compel the changes necessary to end the epidemic. Our advocacy is conducted through a social justice lens because the politics and policies of breast cancer disproportionately affect poor women and women of color. Breast Cancer Action's independence from pharmaceutical company funding puts us in a unique position to address issues of health equity, exposures to toxins in our environment, and to put the needs of patients before pharmaceutical company profits. We have three main program priorities. The first is put patients first, where we work to advocate at the Food and Drug Administration in favor of treatments that are less toxic, more effective, and less expensive than those already available. We also provide information about breast cancer to anyone who needs it. The second is creating healthy environments where we work to reduce the involuntary exposures people encounter that put them at risk for breast cancer by holding corporations accountable for unhealthy products and practices. We also support legislation that would better protect us from chemicals in our environment and would make personal care products safer. And the last is eliminating social inequities related to breast cancer, where we work to create awareness that it is not just genes, but social injustices, political, economic, and racial inequalities that lead to disparities in breast cancer incidence and outcomes. So again, my name is Saru Kaiser, and I'm the Education and Mobilization Coordinator here at Breast Cancer Action. I work on educating the public on issues of health inequities related to breast cancer, mobilizing Breast Cancer Action's national partners on inequities issues, and engaging our members around breast cancer advocacy through our Speakers Bureau. Also joining us is Nika Leiba. Nika is a senior analyst for the, for the Environmental Working Group. She works on various toxic projects at EWG, focusing mostly on cosmetics and water issues. The Environmental Working Group is a nonprofit research and advocacy organization based in Washington, D.C. The mission of the Environmental Working Group is to use the power of public information to protect public health and the environment. The Environmental Working Group specializes in providing useful resources to consumers while simultaneously pushing for national policy change. One of their resources is the Skin Deep Cosmetic Safety Database. 
They launched the Skin Deep Cosmetic Safety Database in 2004 to provide consumers with easy to navigate safety ratings for a wide range of products and ingredients on the market. Their aim is to fill in where industry and government leave off. Thank you so much for joining us today, Nika. Also joining us is Julia Liao. She's the Program Planning Development Director at Asian Health Services. As a co-founder of the California Healthy Nail Salon Collaborative, Julia also helps to manage the collaborative, which was formed in 2005. The collaborative was formed out of the concerns for the health and safety issues of the nail salon workers and owners, particularly because the products that workers handle on a daily basis contain chemicals that are known to be carcinogenic and suspected to cause reproductive harm. The collaborative is composed of public health and environmental advocates, nail salon workers, community-based groups, and other allies and public agencies. Together, we are working to proactively address concerns facing the nail salon community through an integrated approach using policy advocacy, outreach, education strategies, and research. So now we're going to start by talking about the problem. And before I talk about the problem, I just want to make a quick note that I'll talk about cosmetics and personal beauty products, and I'll use these terms interchangeably. Uh, just for clarification, the legal term that's used by the FDA is cosmetics, and it's, um, it refers to not only makeup, like lipsticks and fingernail polish, but also perfumes, skin moisturizer, shampoos, deodorants, and things like that. So the Food and Drug Administration is, uh, quote, responsible for protecting the public's health by assuring the safety, efficacy, and security of human and veterinary drugs biological products, medical devices, our nation's food supply, cosmetics, and products that emit radiation. But according to the FDA, a cosmetic manufacturer may use almost any raw material as a cosmetic ingredient, and these ingredients are not subject to FDA pre-market approval authority, and a final product can be marketed without approval from the FDA. They have no standing cosmetic review safety committee, and they can't force companies to recall harmful products. Now, when I say there's no FDA regulation, I just want to be clear because they do um, regulate and they do conduct pre-market reviews, but it's only for certain color additives and active ingredients and cosmetics that are classified as over-the-counter drugs. Those are the only places where they have any sort of authority to do any pre-market review. So if the FDA is not regulating the cosmetic industry, who is? Um, and we find that 38, the more than $20 billion personal care product industry is actually allowed to self-regulate through an interview panel. So although the cosmetic firms are responsible for substantiating the safety of their products and ingredients before marketing, in the 30 years since their creation of the cosmetic ingredient review panel, they've only evaluated 11% of the ingredients currently used in cosmetics. And we know that more than 500 products sold in the U.S. actually contain ingredients that are banned in cosmetics elsewhere, including Japan, Canada, and the European Union. So according to safety, so we find that in the United States, it's perfectly legal for products that we use every day to contain chemicals linked to breast cancer, hormone disruption, birth defects, and other chronic health problems that are on the rise. So Maybe the solution is to be a more informed consumer and to make choices to use products that are free of toxins, to buy natural. And unfortunately, this is not a solution. Um, it's actually, there's actually um, some very misleading um, labeling because there's no legal standards for organic or natural personal care products sold in the U.S. So really, we're not able to shop our way out of this by looking for natural and organic products. So we know that some of the ingredients in our cosmetics are harmful, and we can look on the back of them, and we can see them in the ingredient list. But there are others that are actually purposefully hidden. So the Federal Fair Packaging and Labeling Act of 1973 um, required companies to list cosmetic ingredients on um, their labels, but it, it, it explicitly exempts fragrance from these federal labeling laws. Um, the uh, EWG has found that types of chemicals, and none of these uh, ingredients are actually required to be listed on the labels. 
Nika will talk a little bit more about um, the Environmental Working Group's 2010 report called Not So Sexy, Hidden Chemicals and Perfumes, and really interesting information shows that assessed the vast majority of these secret in fragrance, personal care products, such as fragrance. Um, they have any safety review panel, the International Fragrance Association, or any other. FDA really lacks authority to require that manufacturers test their cosmetics for safety, including these fragrance products, before they're sold to consumers. And again, the FDA has no authority to order a recall of a cosmetic, um, although they can affirm to voluntarily recall a product. Is that we're all at risk, but some bear a heavier burden. I want to talk a little bit about the critical windows of susceptibility. So the critical windows of susceptibility, also known as the critical result health outcomes, is as the um, time of fetal growth in utero, need maturation of key endocrine systems and are really susceptible to chemical exposure. Studies exposure to synthetic estrogenic chemicals, particularly during these critical windows of susceptibility, may actually be related to girls entering puberty one to two years earlier than they did about 40 years ago. And if we think about lifetime exposures to estrogen, and also chemicals that mimic estrogen, um, c contributing to factors um, that increase our risk for breast cancer, then girls today have a higher cumulative lifetime exposure to estrogen and potentially at a higher risk of de developing breast cancer. Um, and uh, Nika is going to talk a little bit, which is a heavier burden, are uh, women of color. And although personal beauty products are targeted at women as opposed to men, a higher proportion are actually specifically targeted to women of color. Products marketed to black women, uh, like hair relaxers and skin lighteners, actually contain some of the most toxic chemicals used by the cosmetic industry. Other examples of products um, that we're concerned about are perms, texturizers, dyes, and glues, and all of these are used. They contain chemicals and hormones linked to early puberty and cancer that chemicals and hair straighteners may absorb directly into the scalp, and that the greatest users of these straighteners are African-American women who generally have a treatment every four to eight weeks. Women of color also tend to use a greater number of beauty care products. A market research study found that black women actually spend $1.2 billion on beauty and personal care. So this research really points to women of color being exposed to harmful and toxic products that affect their health, potentially at a higher rate than other communities. I also want to talk about uh, Latino, Latinas, which is sort of seen as an untapped market. And there's definitely some um, personal care products uh, brands that are marketing specifically to this population. Uh, I wanted to give a program to enhance a girl's makeup experience via her quinceanera, which is a traditional celebration of a girl's 15th birthday. So what they do is uh, at about three months before the quinceanera, um, the process actually starts at the counter with a, a skin care regime and helping her pick the right cosmetics to enhance her features. About a month before, um, they focus on choosing a look for the quinceanera and what makeup to use. And then about um, a few weeks before, they actually encourage the um, girls getting this population, but really starting young. So another aspect is uh, occupational workers. And I'm going to talk just briefly about this, because Julia will talk more about it. Um, but uh, who work with cosmetics, including uh, barbers, hairstylists, care, body care. Actually, we'll talk a lot more about um, these workers and, and what those impacts look like. But really exacerbated by poorly labeled products, limited safety information, small workplaces, these workers really may be more vulnerable to adverse health effects than the average individual. So, the Safe Cosmetics Act of 2011, um, which is currently circulating in Congress, um, is actually a regulation that will phase out chemicals linked to cancer and reproductive harm. It will also implement a strong safety standard designed to protect children, pregnant women, and workers. It requires full disclosure of the ingredients, including fragrance, and gives the FDA the authority to recall dangerous products. So currently, um, Congress is in the lame duck session, and we're looking to the spring and hoping to work with our coalition partners to push this bill through Congress further. So the larger issue really is looking at whether fe federal government is a watchdog for public health or if they're sort of working for industry. We think that the government actually has a very unique role to play, um, and they can play it in sort of gaps left by research. So this really points to an individual's direct control, as well as research into new treatments that may not be patentable or, or therefore profitable. 
um, and that rates uh, again today, is that the government really needs to support and put in place strong chemical regulation, like the Safe Cosmetics Act, which shifts the burden of proof to demonstrate product safety onto industry rather than where it is now, which is on the backs of government and individuals and consumer health advocates to demonstrate health harms um, in order to regulate and limit those exposures. So having strong regulations will protect public health. Um, it will also reduce exposures to known and suspected health harms from environmental and chemical sources. And also, it will really act to limit industry's influence in this regulatory process. Um, regulations of chemicals is really following this precautionary um, safety rather than individuals having to demonstrate harm. So that means that we're reducing our exposure to chemicals that may be causing cancer instead of reacting after harm has already occurred. So um, on that note, I, um, I've referred to a lot of the um, sort of toxic chemicals in general. And I want to turn it over to Nika, who's going to talk more specifically about the chemicals that we're talking about when we say toxic chemicals. Thank you, Saru. Um, and thanks, everybody, for joining us today to talk about this important topic. Um, I'll just do a little bit of background about exposure, and then I'll go into a little bit more detail about um, some of the toxic chemicals that are found in our everyday personal care products. So we're routinely exposed to chemicals in the water we drink, the food we eat, the air we breathe, and the personal care products that we rub on our skin. Um, and we're becoming increasingly aware of these chemical exposures in part because of increases in diseases and disorders and health problems that doctors aren't able to explain by genetics alone. We've seen increases in diseases like leukemia, in brain cancers in children. We've definitely seen increases in the incidence of autism. Um, and all of this is obviously of concern because in many cases there's no genetic link. So scientists have suggested a link to environmental exposures. So how does cosmetics factor in? Next slide, please. Every day, women are exposed to an average of 12 cosmetics products. Uh, while, no, sorry, women use an average of 12 cosmetics products, while men use an average of six daily. And by using these products, each day goes to an average of about 168 unique chemicals, while men are exposed uh, to about 85 unique chemicals uh, through the use of these products. Uh, next slide, please. Based on EWG's analysis of more than 76,000 cosmetics products in our Skin Deep database, we can estimate that 20% of the personal care products on the market have at least one ingredient linked to cancer. Next slide. 22% of the products have at least one endocrine disruptor. And next slide and 34% of the products have at least one ingredient linked to developmental or reproductive toxicity. Hazardous ingredients can be found across all categories of cosmetics products, um, in products marketed towards all demographics, children, women, men, people of color, all demographics. EWG, along with other groups, have looked extensively into, into many of these categories, and in the next couple slides, I will share a few examples that highlight chemicals of concern. Uh, next slide. In 2012, we analyzed more than 1,800 sunscreens and other SPF products. And we've been doing this sunscreen analysis for six years. And unfortunately, after six years, we found that manufacturers are still using ingredients that are hazardous to our health. One of these ingredients is oxybenzone. Oxybenzone is a common active ingredient in sunscreen products, and it was found in more than half of the, the sunscreens we analyzed this year. The ingredient is a potential hormone disruptor. It may trigger allergic reactions, and it penetrates the skin in relatively large amounts, so much so that scientists have called for parents to avoid using oxybenzone on children due to this penetration risk as well as its toxicity concerns. Uh, next slide, please. Another uh, popular ingredient in SPF products is retinol palmitate. It's a form of vitamin A, and it's used in about a quart, uh, one, one in every four uh, sunscreens on the US market. Government studies found that this ingredient speeds the development of skin tumors and lesions, 
when applied in the presence of sunlight. Next slide, please. In 2010, as Saru mentioned earlier, EWG and the Campaign for Safe Cosmetics released the report Not So Sexy, Hidden Chemicals in Perfumes and Colognes. The report highlighted that fragrance can be concocted from any number of the more than 3,000 stock chemicals the fragrance, fragrance industry has, and this blend is almost always kept hidden from the consumer. Lab tests commissioned by the campaign and analyzed by EWG reveal that the average fragrance products contain about 14 secret chemicals, and by secret I mean they were not listed on the label, they were hidden behind this fragrance term. Among these hidden chemicals were chemicals associated with hormone disruption, sensitizers, and even more concerning in some cases, chemicals that had not yet been assessed for, for safety in personal care products. These hidden chemicals are not just limited to perfumes, but in fact, any product that has that term fragrance on the label has this problem. That fragrance term hides a blend that could be concocted of, of many unknown um, chemicals to the user. When sprayed or applied to the skin, these chemicals from perfumes or cosmetics are inhaled, ingested, and absorbed. Next slide, please. Saru so also mentioned this study that we, we, we did in 2008. It was a study that was called Teen Girls Body Burden of Hormone, Teen Girls' Body Burden of Hormone Altering Chemicals, a mouthful. So we did it because we know that teen girls use more personal care products daily than the average adult woman. They use about 17, while the average adult woman uses about 12. And as mentioned earlier, they're in this critical um, window of susceptibility. This window is called adolescence. We tested uh, 20 teenage girls for 25 cosmetic chemicals. We took blood and urine samples, and all the samples were collected on just one day. Next slide, please. Overall, 16 chemicals were found, an average of 13 chemicals in each girl. The 16 chemicals that were found were all hormone alterers. That means they all, they all, all 16 altered the hormone levels. Um, adolescence encompasses a, a period of maturation of the reproductive system, the immune system, the hormone system. It encompasses a period of rapid bone growth, shift in metabolism, and key changes to the brain structure and function. And emerging research suggests that during this period of change and growth, teens are particularly sensitive to exposures, even to really small levels of hormone-disrupting chemicals. Two groups of chemicals that we detected in the teen girls were phthalates and parabens. And these ingredients are found widely in products used by all demographics. Next slide, please. Phthalates may be found in nail polishes and are commonly used as ingredients in fragrance mixtures. The CDC reports that phthalates are detectable in nearly every American, from babies all the way to adults. Studies suggest that exposure to phthalates increase the risk of uh, reproductive system birth defects and hormonal changes in baby boys. In adult men, they're linked to damages, damage in sperm. Phthalate exposures are also linked to thyroid irregularities in both men and women and to asthma and skin allergies. They're also linked to obesity and insulin res resistance, a condition that can lead to type 2 diabetes. Next slide, please. And parabens are a group of artificial preservatives commonly found in um, many personal care products. They were found in all 20 of the teen girls that we tested in the study I just mentioned. Uh, studies have indicated that parabens are endocrine disruptors, so they disrupt the normal functioning of the hormone system. The European Union has gone as far as banning certain forms of parabens in the use of personal care products because of the concern. Parabens are pretty ubiquitous, and we found them in Skin Deep. We, ha we see them in more than 25,000 products. Thank you so much, Nika, for that presentation and for giving us a little more clarity on, on what some of those chemicals are. I um, have on the screen um, 
some contact information for the Environmental Working Group, their website, and also their Skin Deep website. And um, we'll post these again during the webinar, and I will also be sending them in an email. So if you don't have a chance to write them down now, you'll have another chance. So why do we need safe cosmetics? As I talked about, um, summary of the problem. Consumers are really in the dark. We assume that the cosmetics that we buy have been tested and regulated, but unfortunately it really is the opposite. And the products we use are not used once or in, in isolation. As Nika mentioned, an average woman uses 12 products a day, exposing them to 168 unique ingredients. Teen girls use 17 products, exposing them to even more unique ingredients. So we're using these products with numerous potentially harmful chemicals repeatedly and in combination with other consumer products with no understanding of the potential long-term damage. We also talked about that although we're all at risk, there are some that are really assuming a greater risk, and this is unacceptable. We shouldn't have to worry that the products that we put on our bodies or that we work with are making us sick. So last year we had a similar webinar on toxic cosmetics. And um, it was a really great webinar that got people thinking. We had a really good discussion. And then over the past year, there's been a lot of news around harmful chemicals in our beauty products. And I wanted to um, talk about a couple of them. So the first one is uh, formaldehyde and Brazilian blowout. And Brazilian blowout is a product used in salons to chemically straighten hair. And it was found to have a dangerously high level of formaldehyde, even though the product was labeled formaldehyde-free. Now, formaldehyde in California is listed as a chemical known to cause cancer. So the FDA sent a warning letter to Brazilian Blowout stating that the product was adulterated and misbranded. And it gave them um, about a month to comply. Um, at the same time, the California Attorney General fied, filed an injunction against Brazilian Blowout seeking to require health warnings on their products. And in January of this year, the manufacturers of Brazilian Blowout were actually forced to, um, to label their product and put caution stickers. Um, and this was a, a settlement um, that was agreed to with the California Attorney General's office. And this settlement is actually the first comprehensive and enforceable action by a U.S. government authority to address formaldehyde exposures associated with these products. So another, another um, thing that came up, and I'm actually going to let Julia talk a little bit more about it, but um, it's about unlisted toxic ingredients in nail polishes. So the California Department of Toxic Substances Controlled um, tested a bunch of nail polishes and found that contrary to what manufacturers um, were labeling their products of um, being free of di dibutyl phthalate and toluene, which are um, two ingredients that are part of a toxic trio, they actually found that um, nail polishes actually contain one or even both of these substances. And again, I'm going to let Julia talk a little bit more about that. The other is lead and lipstick. Now, lead is actually a contaminant. It's not an ingredient that would be labeled or, or, or on the label. So in 2007, the Campaign for Safe Cosmetics did a study, tested lipstick brands, and they found that 61% of the lipstick brands they tested actually had residues of lead. Now, the FDA did a follow-up study in 2009 with an expanded survey looking, I think, at about 400 lipsticks um, and posted those results at the end of last year. So this new report found that there were higher levels of lead in lipstick than previously had been reported. Now, recent science indicates that there's no safe level of lead exposure, and, and the CDC actually states that there's no safe blood lead level that's been identified, and yet the FDA has still not set a safety standard for lead in lipstick. So another issue is looking at pink ribbon cosmetic companies. And these are uh, cosmetic companies that are um, with a cosmetic product. And, and they're really fighting to keep their products among the least regulated in the country. For example, Avon, which uh, claims to be in it to end it, actually has products um, that have chemicals linked to breast cancer and other diseases, uh, chemicals like parabens and triclosan and formaldehyde-releasing preservatives. And last year, we also saw Susan G. Komen um, put out a perfume called Promise Me that actually 
had unlisted chemicals that were regulated as toxic and hazardous and had not been adequately evaluated for human safety and actually demonstrated negative health effects. And we had a campaign last year called Raise a Stink addressing that. Um, and we saw that Susan G. Komen actually pulled their products from the market earlier this year. Another pink ribbon product company, uh, Estee Lauder and, and L'Oreal, uh, L'Oreal actually makes five of the ten most lead-contaminated brands in the FDA study. So I also wanted to talk about um, the report on car carcinogens, which uh, every two years the National Institute of Health publishes this report. It's a 500-page report, and it provides scientific-based, non-biased information about those chemicals that can increase our risk for cancer. It's, a, it's the federal government's official list of chemicals known or reasonably anticipated to cause cancer in humans. And really, only after a chemical is identified as being a threat to our health through these scientific reports can steps be taken at this point um, to reduce our exposures to toxins in public health. Uh, and currently, the chemical industry is actually actively working to defund this really important and critical report. So what does all of this tell us? It, it tells us that we really need some stronger government regulations. Over just the past year, we've had a number of examples of cosmetics um, being marketed and put out um, on the market that have chemicals uh, of concern and um, that are potentially putting us at risk for um, an increase. Now I want to um, turn it over to Julia, and she's going to California Healthy Nail Salon Collaborative and um, their work in California. Okay, well, thanks so much, um, Saru. Um, thanks for having me, and um, it's a great pleasure to um, be on this webinar this morning. Um, so next slide. So I wanted to provide a little bit of context about the nail salon industry um, before I uh, dove into the issues and um, what workers are facing. Um, you know, right now we have a lot of um, a lot of celebrities who are uh, uh, posting on, you know, ads for the hottest nail polish colors. And Beyonce recently opened up her um, newest cosmetology center focused on hair and nails. Uh, next slide. And the New York Times and Time Magazine actually recently did articles around, um, you know, the economic downturn and talking about economic indicators. And, you know, in the past it has been hemline length or denim sales, but the latest actually um, has been nail polish. Um, and nail polish has been an indicator in the sense that during these times of economic creators, uh, actually um, consumers have been buying more nail polish, um, indicating that we are looking for more affordable and bargain luxuries. Next slide. Um, the industry is a $7.3 billion industry and, um, you know, you know, even though there's all these celebrities that are, um, you know, talking about the uh, polishes and, you know, beauty products, et cetera, what is not being said is all the types of chemicals that are actually in nail care products. And so this is just um, a sample chart of some of those chemicals. Um, what we know is that uh, these chemicals are known carcinogens, um, teratogens, there's um, irritants, um, and reproductively harmful chemicals. Uh, next slide. In fact, the San Francisco Department of Environment did an analysis of um, nail care products, and what they found were that there were um, 450 uh, unique chemicals um, with a little bit more than half with some type of um, health impact data, um, and 80 that we knew have evidence of harm. Next slide. And what has been really troubling is, um, again, as Sarah has suggested, as mentioned before, the um, Department of Toxic Substance Control recently did a um, testing of uh, nail products um, back in April of this year. Um, and they found that actually many nail um, products, especially particularly polishes, um, that this um, that manufacturers were actually not being truthful about their labeling, um, and that basically 
um, many of them that had claimed, for instance, to be toluene free um, were actually not and had actually higher concentrations of toluene than polish that didn't claim to be toluene free. Um, so there's definitely an issue um, of you know, manufacturer accountability that has been highlighted by this report. And um, the California Helping Nelson Collaborative also did testing um, itself, um, which um, previously substantiated a lot of these claims. Next slide. So what was industry uh, interesting was that the industry responded um, in a letter. Actually, you know, the, the relevant issues in nail phones today are not chemicals, but rather ventilation, sanitation, work practices, training, and education. Um, basically, um, putting the blame on um, the workers and how they handle the products. Um, they also said that the levels of ingredient concern are very low, and that there's no data to suggest that. Um, the over 30-year history of this industry presents any significant health risk for nail technicians. Next slide. But on the contrary, actually, um, there are studies out there that um, recent studies, because this is an emerging issue, that there um, workers do experience significant health problems, um, acute health symptoms such as skin irritations, headaches, respiratory problems. They experience a lot of neurocognitive conditions um, and reproductive problems. Um, and there's a great concern because we know that these chemicals are uh, carcinogenic and so um, concerned about the long-term effects of cancer. And we have had a lot of workers um, give us and tell us stories about um, having breast cancer and having skin cancer and wondering if there is that connection. And again, because this has been more of an emerging issue, it's been challenging because the studies um, on cancer um, associations tend to be, um, have to be 20-year studies and, um, you know, it hasn't um, been long enough. Um, but I think, you know, we're really concerned in many ways that the workers, they are the canaries in the coal mine and we are seeing effects already. Next slide. We're particularly concerned um, with the workers because they handle um, the nail care products day in, day out, six to seven days a week, eight to, eight to ten hours a day. So they have a regular exposure to a multitude of chemicals. And because they are mainly low-income immigrant population, um, they don't have access to health care and, and um, legal services. And so oftentimes what happens is there's inadequate attention to their health Symptoms leading to a lot of chronic illnesses. And because of the nature of the work, um, they're bending over, constantly using their hands, they also have a lot of, um, experience a lot of ergonomic problems. And because the nail salon industry, primarily a lot of small businesses, um, it's been challenging um, to have um, sufficient, sufficient ventilation. Um, and that's also um, causing exacerbation of the chemical effects of the products on the workers. Next slide. In general, what we know about nail salon workers is that in California, we know that up to 80% are of Vietnamese descent, and that 40% in the United States are of Asian descent, and that overall 95% are women of reproductive age, um, and they are recent immigrants who speak limited English. What's also interesting is that many who have come from Vietnam have had homeland exposures to chemical warfare. Um, they tend to earn, on average, less than $19,600 a year. And because of the nature of the industry, um, you know, there's unstable business, a lot of high turnover of shops and ownership. Uh, many workers are actually um, independent contractors, not necessarily employees, and so as a result, um, there's a lack of worker-based health insurance. Um, the other thing that's been, um, because of the nature of the industry and the immigration patterns, this uh, nail salon industry um, tends to be very family-oriented. Um, the businesses are owned by um, the uncles and cousins and um, husbands and wives um, of family members. And so um, the owner and worker relationship is definitely um, you know, one that's been uh, challenging in terms of in thinking about um, you know, organizing um, as a union and, and labor perspective. The next slide. 
So given sort of the complex issues that the nail salon worker uh, population faces, um, the nail salon, California Healthy Nail Salon Collaborative came together in 2005 as environmental justice, um, environmental health, public health, and reproductive justice, and advocates. Um, just coming together knowing that we needed to be able to uh, intersect on policy, research, outreach, and education um, strategies and approaches. Um, because the industry, again, it's um, occupational worker concerns, um, it relates to consumer um, exposures as well, um, and also looking at sort of public health approach with regards to protection um, in sanitation, um, and then also overall just worker rights. And so we have come together um, to really address this um, issue on a very uh, multi-tiered and multi-faceted level. And we're statewide and currently have 40 members. Next slide. And we are um, fiscally sponsored by Asian Health Services, which is a community clinic here in Oakland, Chinatown. Um, they were actually the first ones who noted the health issues of the Vietnamese nail salon workers um, as they did outreach to the community talking about um, health disparities. Um, and uh, they have been um, a huge uh, anchor for the collaborative. The next slide. So I wanted to kind of go through an example of what we've been doing to address these issues. And one example on a policy advocacy level um, was what we did locally in San Francisco. And so what we had heard, of course, from workers that they were concerned about the chemicals that they worked with. Um, and then our members themselves were saying, well, let's look at how we can actually um, improve the situation. Maybe we can take a comprehensive approach and actually ban some of these chemicals. Um, and we've been you know, exploring how we can identify champions um, locally um, in San Francisco um, and did find a few that said they were interested in addressing this issue. Next slide. And so when we brought up this idea about how about if we ban um, the top three most of chemicals of concern, formaldehyde, dibutyl phthalate, and toluene. And when we brought that to the community, a lot of workers um, were concerned. They said, well, we support that, but we actually don't make the decisions in our workplace. Owners had expressed to us, well, if you ban that, then um, I'm concerned it will put me out of business because um, what do I do in terms of the products? They may be, they may be more expensive. Um, and then policymakers came to us and said, the local ones had said, well, we're concerned about federal preemption. And then the Department of Public Health um, had told us, well, you know, to effectively enforce a ban, um, how are we going to do that? Because we really don't have um, enough money given the city budget cuts. Next slide. And so having discussion with our community members, and we hold regular meetings with them, um, we decided that um, as a group that perhaps what would work instead of a ban is actually um, a more of a carrot approach. Um, why not do more of a recognition program to um, support those salons that are doing the right thing and um, utilizing the safer products that are out there, ones that are truthfully labeling. Um, and so when we um, proposed that to the general public, we found that there was a lot of um, support and great sentiment sentiment for passing something like this. And you know, got over 100 worker and owner signatures in San Francisco, um, over you know, almost 300 um, signatures from uh, San Francisco residents. Um, and then we actually have the Department of Environment who came in and said, this is actually a great idea. This can set a great foundation um, for potentially um, having nail phones become green business models. Um, but they wanted more information. The next slide. And so what we did is, um, as we um, slowly got support from all of these different entities, um, we were able to work with um, Supervisor and Board President um, Supervisor Chu. And we put together a media event to really generate a lot of um, momentum and around this particular recognition program ordinance. And so what we did is we partnered with a local cosmetology school to provide free manicures that utilized um, safer products that were truthfully labeling and invited a lot of media um, and also featured a film that we had 
done with Brave New Films called 16 Deaths a Day, which highlighted the plight of uh, nail film workers. And it was really great because I think it was key to generating a lot of momentum around this recognition program ordinance. And you can see there's pictures of some of our workers who are being interviewed. Um, and we were highlighted by Huffington Post and, and New York Times. Next slide. And these are pictures of, um, you know, once it came to a public comment hearing, um, because we were able to do a lot of the groundwork with the community already, and it was actually their um, idea about this recognition program, we had a lot of folks who came out to testify in support of this um, program. And these are um, both owners and workers who um, are telling the Board of Supervisors why they should support this ordinance. Next slide. And what was exciting was, as a result, um, the ordinance was passed unanimously um, by the Board of Supervisors in San Francisco. Um, and it's currently being implemented. And uh, there are over, um, I think, 25 nail salons who are registered um, to um, be certified as healthy nail salons. And so San Francisco Department of Environment is in process and um, going to be um, uh, doing a press conference um, soon to announce all the great work that has been uh, done on moving this ordinance forward. Next slide, please. So really, I think that um, this is just a case of one of the uh, projects that we've been working on and campaigning on. Um, I think we really see this as a, a great start and standard in really leveraging um, this type of recognition program to push for more safer products and for the shops to utilize more of those um, products out there. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that overall, um, I think you can start with the next part, um, is that we're going to be doing um, a postcard campaign um, to uh, hold the manufacturers accountable to truthfully labeling. Um, again, and we see this Healthy Salon program as um, the foundation for much of the work can leverage um, manufacturer accountability. Um, and we do have a lot of um, cities and other counties across um, within the state, actually, um, interested in um, potentially modeling after what San Francisco did. Next slide. And so with that, I just wanted to you know, acknowledge all of our members, all of our national partners, all of our government allies, and especially on the salon community um, who really helped to um, make this happen. I think without them, um, we can't um, you know, help to make a lot of the policies um, and activities um, needed to help make this mission of upholding the health, safety, and rights of the community um, happen. Next slide. And uh, this is my contact information. And so you know, if you have any other questions, feel free to reach me. Um, and I've also posted our website um, address here below. Thank you so much, Julia, for that wonderful presentation. And um, I want to recognize that we are running a little um, behind schedule. Um, and so we have a few more slides. Um, and I want to be able to have some time for questions. So hopefully everyone will be able to stay on for a little bit of uh, extra extra time. So uh, I wanted to just take a moment to talk about some, um, some change and success that has, um, that has happened. So prompted by concerns raised by uh, the Campaign for Safe Cosmetics and also uh, their partners, Johnson & Johnson uh, actually announced that it's going to be removing some of the carcinogens and toxic chemicals from its baby and adult products globally, which is wonderful and, and a, a huge a victory, but we also recognize that they're not removing all <laughs> of the harmful ingredients, um, and so we will continue to, to push for push for that as well. Um, as Julia spoke about uh, the establishment of the San Francisco Healthy Nail Salon uh, program model, which is also gaining interest um, across other counties here in the Bay Area. Um, the other is that there are some nail polish companies that are making an effort to voluntarily make their products less toxic. And although the report um, that we spoke about found that there was mislabeling of products as 3Free, there are companies that are um, really making an effort to remove the toxic trio like Zoya and OPI and Le Chat. And then um, I mentioned this before, but our um, Think Before You Pink campaign last October called Raise a Stink, which focused on Komen and their Promise Me perfume. 
um, was actually successful. We had more than 5,000 activists join us and demand an end to the protection of Promise Me, which we were calling a pink washing perfume. And um, in May of this year, Komen actually ended their partnership with the company um, that was producing Promise Me perfume, which effectively removed it from the market. So although these are you know, really great victories and changes, and they've only happened because of community organizing and consumer pressure, we really feel like going company by company, chemical by chemical, is not really going to get us to that broad reform. And to get there, we really need the federal regula regulations like the Safe Chemicals Act and also the Safe Cosmetics Act. So I, I, these are just some of the resources that we've talked about through the webinar. The, um, if you would like to take a look at the full report um, on nail polishes, it's there. Also, the California Healthy Nail Salon Collaborative's website has a lot of information. We mentioned the Skin Deep database if you want to look up uh, products that you have for their toxicity rating, the Campaign for Safe Cosmetics, and the National Healthy Nail and Beauty Salon Alliance. So now that we've talked about the problem, you understand the chemicals and also uh, the legislation that's out there, um, you're probably wondering how, how to get involved. So I, I hope that it has been stressed enough, and if it's not, I'm going to continue to stress it, that regulatory reform is so important, and I really want to emphasize it. It's really essential to make the products we use safer and the environment we live in healthier. So sending a message to your elected officials, letting them know that you support systemic change to ensure that companies can't put harmful chemicals in their products is really key. You can tell them to support and endorse the Safe Cosmetics Act of 2011 and make cosmetics safer for everyone. And that really is empowering the FDA to ensure that cosmetics are free and harm, uh, of harmful ingredients. Also, the Safe Chemicals Act of 2011 um, and that's looking to empower the EPA to ensure the safety of industrial chemicals. And the Safe Chemicals Act actually um, passed out of the Senate committee and will go to the full Senate uh, for discussion and debate in the spring. So um, if you are uh, a member of Breast Cancer Action, you will definitely will keep you um, abreast of, of what is going on with that. You can also continue to use consumer pressure. Um, you can write or call to companies whose products you use and let them know that you're a customer and you want safe products without toxic uh, chemicals. And you can encourage the companies to sign Breast Cancer Action's pledge to prevent pinkwashing. You can also participate in the postcard campaign that Julia was talking about, which is targeting manufacturers of nail products. And we'll let you know more that as that um, campaign develops. So we're going to open it up to your questions in about a minute. But before we do, I just wanted to talk a little bit more about how you can get involved. Now, as I said, you can sign up for Breast Cancer Action's RLE alerts. And um, you can keep up to date on the issues. You can also join us on Facebook and Twitter to connect with others and help change the conversation about the breast cancer epidemic. You can help others get involved. You can tell your friends, coworkers, and family about this webinar and also the different ways that they can take action. And last, you can donate advocacy work. So again, I want to remind you that Breast Cancer Action relies on your support to make these webinars possible, and your individual support is so crucial. If you've been inspired today, please consider making a donation of $25 or more so we can continue these webinars. You can go to www.bcaction.org backslash donate. I want to give a really big thank you to Nika and Julia for their presentations today. And now I would like to take some time to answer some questions. Um, and as I said before, you can um, people have been writing in questions as we've been presenting. And um, I also um, encourage you to uh, ask your questions, and we'll make sure to answer as many as we can. So the first question we have, someone was asking if they can get a copy of these slides after the presentation. And that's a great question. Um, we always post a recording of our webinars on our website about a week after they air. So you can go to our website and view the whole um, presentation again. Also, I will be sending a follow-up email to everyone who's registered and attended the webinar. And in that email, There'll be a link to a survey for you to give feedback about the webinar. There'll be some of the resources that we talked about. And also, 
there will be a, a PDF of the slides. So hopefully that answers the question. Um, Nika, someone was asking if you could talk a little bit more about the Skin Deep database. Uh, sure. The Skin Deep database is one of EWG's flagship products. Um, it was built in about 2004. And uh, up to now, as I mentioned, we have more than 70,000 personal care products. We look at all the ingredients in each personal care product, and we uh, give each ingredient a score from 0 to 10, 0 giving it a green light and that it's safer, and 10 meaning that it's hazardous, it's a hazard database. And then based on the ingredient scores and you know how the product is used, who uses it, what demographic uses it, we give the overall product a score. Again, going from 0 to 10 where 0 means that it's, it's free of, of hazards as far as or literature shows and, and 10 meaning that it's hazardous. Thank you. Thank you so You're much. Um, Julia, someone asked um, what the toxic trio was. I thought you would be a good person to just um, explain that briefly. Yeah, the toxic trio, so those are um, the top three chemicals of concern that we had identified. Um, they are toluene, formaldehyde, and dibutyl phthalate. And um, they, as a group, are um, known to be uh, they're carcinogens as well as reproductively harmful chemicals um, and neurotoxicants. So it was of great concern to us. And so those were the ones that we had um, targeted. And um, for the Healthy um, Nail Sun Recognition Program, uh, one of the requirements is that they utilize um, products um, and polishes that are actually just polishes that are toxic trio free. Um, and the Department of Environment has been extremely um, uh, vigilant about, um, you know, just recommending those that, um, again, according to the DTSC report, are um, being the truthful labelers. So um, they've been really um, great and about that. And so um, I think it's exciting to see that there's a push to utilize more of the, um, the toxic trio free products that are being truthful. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Um, so there's a question um, from someone that says, is there a recognition program uh, for good cosmetic companies that have no chemicals of concern or very few? Um, I'm going to take a step and then I'll ask Nick or Julie if they have anything um, to add. Um, so as far as I know, there's not uh, a recognition program specifically. What, what there is um, is uh, Breast Cancer Action has, uh, like we were talking about, the pledge to prevent pig washing, which is asking companies t to sign a document saying that um, they pledge to not sell or manufacture or target products um, that raise money for breast cancer uh, to women that may increase their risk of breast cancer. Um, so there, there are the companies that have signed that. Uh, as a place to start. There's also the Campaign for Safe Cosmetics has a, um, I'm, I'm not going to remember the exact language, but you can find it on their website. It's, it's the um, Safe Businesses Network and uh, something like that. And they have, I think, over 100 businesses that have uh, pledged to um, manufacture or have safe products. That's a, a place to start. But I, I really want to, I, I think that, you know, we all, want to do what we can individually, and I think that's important, but I think it's also important to remember that um, there's only so much we can do as individuals to protect ourselves and our families, and really what we need is to um, demand that the, the government um, enact these strong regulations so that, that we're all protected and that we're all safe, and it's not just about what you can do for you and your family. And, and also the, the fact that you know we can only do as much as we can based on the information that we're given. And, and as we've talked about today, we're not given all the information or, or we're, things are, are not labeled um, correctly. I don't, I don't know, Nico or Julia, if you have anything to add on that. Um, I can, so the Campaign for Safe Cosmetics Business Network is definitely uh, a, a good example there. Uh, I think it's also important to point out that um, 
you know, in some cases, there are companies that, that make greener products in some sectors while still making products with hazardous ingredients in other sectors. Um, so it's a little bit tricky. And that's why it's not always on a, a company by company basis, but rather a lot more on a product by product basis where you look at good products. But there are um, companies where they try to ensure that their entire line is devoid of hazardous ingredients. Um, and the, the campaign's business network would be a, a place that you could find some of those for sure. Yeah, I, I think that's a great um, piece of it is, is that, you know, there are companies that manufacture different products for different markets and um, they're going to be uh, different depending on what the regulations are, you know, different products for the U.S. market versus the European Union market, which has stricter regulations. Um, oh, so someone sort of just asked that question. Is it correct that the same brand products made in the U.S. and sold in Europe contain different ingredients? And yes. <laughs> that um, for some companies that, that is the case. And it's, again, showing us that regulation drives the safety of products sometimes. In the European Union, they have much stricter regulations around um, ingredient and, and safety, um, uh, safety testing. And so um, a company like Johnson & Johnson uh, has to adhere to different regulations if they want to market to the European Union market versus the U.S. market. Okay, I'm, I'm reading through the questions. Uh, so this is again related to the Skin Deep database. Nika, someone says, how frequently are products reviewed for Skin Deep database for the Skin Deep database since products are always changing, and and how does uh, the environmental working group keep up with all the new products? That's a really good question, and it's part of why Skin Deep is, is um, such a huge project here. Uh, we are always updating the products in, in the Skin Deep database. We're on a roll-in basis. We're always accepting product information from companies or getting it from other sources, and that happens throughout the year. Um, so we have a team of about six scientists uh, myself included, that work on that database, and, and we're always upload, uh, updating the products, and we'll update the science as new science comes up. Great. Thank you. Um, so I think I'm going to um, take probably one more question, and, uh, and then we're um, going to close up because we are actually running past the time. Um, Excuse me, someone asks, what are some of the limitations of the Safe Chemicals Act? And if the act is only focused on regulation, it seems as if chemical companies would continue using petrol, petroleum-based chemicals. Shouldn't there be a push towards green chemistry um, slash alternatives? Um, so this, this person is asking um, about the Safe Chemicals Act, which we actually didn't talk specifically about, um, but we were talking about the Safe Cosmetics Act. Um, and uh, I. For the Safe Cosmetics Act, I don't think there's anything in there that's specific towards pushing green chemistry and alternatives. And Nika and Julia, you can um, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but it's really around the not only giving um, the FDA more authority um, around recall um, abilities, but also around the labeling um, of uh, and full disclosure of the ingredients and helping to phase out some of those chemicals linked to cancer and reproductive harm. I don't, Nika or Julie, I don't know if you have anything to say on that. I'm going to assume no. Uh, yeah, no. OK. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it at there. there. There definitely are some other questions that we um, didn't have a chance to um, answer, and I want to really encourage people, um, if your question wasn't answered or if you have questions that come up after you've had a chance to think about all this information, to so please um, reach out and um, email me. Um, you can email me at info at bcaction.org. You can also respond when you get my email, um, follow-up email, which you'll probably receive later today or next week. So I want to thank everyone for um, 
being on the call and, and staying with us as we ran a little bit longer. Thank you for your thoughtful questions and your comments. Um, and again, uh, please watch for a short survey that we'll send you uh, via email.